Welcome back to Calculus One. In this lecture, we're going to introduce a very useful theorem in calculus for evaluating limits, something known as L'Hopital's Rule. All right, so to get started, first, this guy was French. So it's L'Hopital, not L Hospital. If you ever say L Hospital in a calculus course, you automatically fail. So it's L'Hopital's rule. All right, and L'Hopital, um, as it turns out, was uh, a French mathematician who wrote the first calculus textbook uh, right in 1696, so kind of as uh, calculus was coming into developing, he wrote the first textbook that was then uh, circulated around the world. All right, aside from that brief history, let's get to what this is. This is a way to evaluate limits by using derivatives. And this, if you think about it, is a little circular. If you think back to the beginning of the course, we used limits to give the definition of derivatives. We have here the limit definition of f prime of x, the first derivative, a limit as h approaches zero for what we call here the difference quotient, f of x plus h minus f of x all divided by h. So at the time, we first understood limits and then put limits to use to define derivatives. What we're doing now is a little backwards uh, our goal is to evaluate a limit here, something as uh, x approaches a of some expression f of x divided by g of x. And as it turns out, using derivatives in whatever L'Hopital's rule is will give us a way to evaluate these limits. Now, before we get into the technical details of what L'Hopital's rule is, worth pointing out there's a few indeterminate forms that we've been encountering through the course. Back when we introduced the limit definition of a derivative, we saw the indeterminate forms of type zero divided by zero and infinity divided by infinity a lot. There are other types of indeterminate forms, for instance, infinity minus infinity, zero to the zero, and infinity to the zero. And these are all indeterminate forms uh, in the eyes of calculus, and they require um, some more tools to deal with them when they pop up in various expressions involving limits. Uh, these are going to play a role in what we see in uh, L'Hopital's rule. So at this point, let's go ahead and state what L'Hopital's rule is, and then we'll get to uh, putting it to use in a lot of examples. All right, so we have here a statement of L'Hopital's rule. Uh, I put off to the side there of the title. The goal here is we're trying to evaluate a limit, and it's not just any limit, but it's a limit of some sort of fraction, f of x, divided by g of x. That ties into the first two basic indeterminate forms, the fractions 0 divided by 0 and infinity divided by infinity. Those are both um, fractional indeterminate forms, which is uh, what L'Hopital's rule is going to apply to. All right, so the precise statement of L'Hopital's rule is here. It starts with two functions, f and g. Those are the functions in the numerator and denominator referenced right above. And we assume that they're differentiable, in other words, smooth. They have derivatives that exist. Uh, and also that the derivative of g, g prime, isn't zero. That's just so that way in the uh, statement of uh, L'Hopital's rule at the bottom there, uh, you might see it, there's a g prime in the denominator. Uh, we don't want to have division by zero, so we assume that from the beginning. All right, so we're going to assume that the functions f and g are differentiable and that g prime is not zero on an interval containing the x value that we're approaching. So notice here we have a limit as x approaches a. We would want these uh, conditions to apply on some interval of x values around that value a. All right, there's two other parts. It says, suppose that we have the limit of f of x and g of x as x approaches a, both approaching zero. 
that gives you the indeterminate form zero over zero. There is another possibility, which is that F and G, as X approaches A, could approach positive and negative infinity. And in that possibility, that gives you the indeterminate form of type infinity divided by infinity. So what this is saying is if our original limit as X approaches A of F of X divided by G of X, if that has an indeterminate form of type zero over zero or infinity over infinity, then we get the conclusion. And the conclusion stated down here is that the original limit, the limit of F of X divided by G of X as X approaches A, that is equal to the limit as X approaches A of F prime of X divided by G prime of X. So that's where the derivatives tie in, as we mentioned uh, in our intro part of this lecture. We're evaluating a limit, but L'Hopital's rule allows us to rewrite this as an equivalent limit using derivatives. Now, all this applies only if the original limit has an indeterminate form. And that's something that we'll uh, keep mentioning as we go through some examples. Before we move on, let's just mention a few um, useful tips and uh, remarks that I want to point out. Uh, the first is L'Hopital's rule only applies if there is an indeterminate form of type zero over zero or infinity over infinity. If you have an indeterminate form of any of the other three types listed above, you're going to have to rewrite the function. And that's something we'll see in some uh, following examples. All right, a second thing I want to mention is here we have it as a limit as X approaches A, a two-sided limit. L'Hopital's rule applies also if you're doing or using one-sided limits as X approaches A from the right or left. And it also applies as X approaches infinity or negative infinity with a um, limit uh, at infinity. So pretty much any limit involving an indeterminate form, uh, L'Hopital's rule will apply to. Doesn't matter if it's approaching A from one or two sides, or as uh, X is approaching um, not necessarily a finite number, but let's say infinity. All right, and the third and probably the most important thing to mention for um, students starting off in the calculus sequence in our course Calc 1, L'Hopital's rule deals with a fraction or quotient. Be careful, even though L'Hopital's rule says something about derivatives for a limit involving a quotient, the statement of L'Hopital's rule does not have us applying the quotient rule. So pretty much do not apply the quotient rule when using L'Hopital's rule. All right, with that in mind, let's get to some examples. Uh, we'll see a few of them throughout this lecture. The first example, one with various parts, uh, these examples are pretty straightforward. So let's go through part A together. So in order to see if we can apply L'Hopital's rule, we first wanna check if the original limit gives an indeterminate form. And here we're letting X approach zero. So we can straightforwardly plug that into our expression here e to the x minus one divided by two x. Uh, recall e to the zero, anything to the zero power is one. So we get zero in our numerator and zero in the denominator. So we do have our basic uh, indeterminate form zero over zero. That means that we can apply L'Hopital's rule to this. All right, and the examples that we're gonna be working through just to kind of um, keep track of what we're doing going from one part to the next. Notice I put a little LR beneath the equal sign. That's a little thing I like to do to indicate I have applied L'Hopital's rule going from the limit on the left to this expression and limit on the right side of that equality sign. So if you apply L'Hopital's rule, differentiate the numerator, e to the x minus one just differentiates to e to the x, and differentiate your denominator, 2x differentiates to two. As we mentioned in one of the third uh, remarks, do not apply the quotient rule here 
you differentiate numerator and denominator individually. So we get for our derivatives here, e to the x, and then two. And at this point, notice this limit that we have is no longer indeterminate. If you plug in zero for x, you get a determinate value. Here, your limit approaches one half. All right, this is a straightforward example uh, where we applied L'Hopital's rule. At this point, pause the video and give yourself an attempt at part B and C. Those ones are also uh, straightforward. We'll check in in a few minutes. All right, welcome back. Let's go through part B. Uh, this is a limit as x approaches zero for sine of x divided by x, which we might have encountered earlier in the course. At the time, we did have a, um, a really nice, simple way to see that this limit value is one. But here, by applying L'Hopital's rule, we can see that with very minimal work. So first off, we need to check that we have an indeterminate form. You can obviously see that we get zero in the denominator, but don't uh, forget your basic trig values. Think of the basic unit circle, sine of the angle zero gives you the y coordinate zero here. So sine of zero is zero, and we do get an indeterminate form uh, of type zero divided by zero. So this indicates that we can apply L'Hopital's rule differentiate numerator and denominator individually. Sine of x differentiates to cosine of x. x differentiates to 1. We now have a limit that is no longer indeterminate. If you plug in x as 0, you're left with just cosine of 0, which again is another basic trig value. Cosine of 0 is 1. So we do find, in a much more straightforward uh, way, that this limit for sine of x divided by x, as x approaches zero, equals one. All right, let's get to part C. This one is a little trickier, simply because your, uh, your trig uh, is probably not as fresh as you might want it to be. So let's first just review how uh, uh, we see that there is an indeterminate form here. Uh, for this limit, we're letting x approach pi over two. And if you were to plug this in, Notice your numerator is cosine squared of x. That really means we first do cosine of that x value and then square that whole quantity. So we have here cosine of pi over 2. That quantity is then squared. And then in your denominator, we have sine of pi over 2 minus 1. Now, hopefully, again, you're on top of your basic trig values. Here's a very simple unit circle. What we want to look at is the sine and cosine values for the angle pi over 2 uh, radians. And if you look up there on the positive y-axis, the coordinates of the point on the unit circle corresponding to angle pi over 2 radians is the ordered pair 0, 1. So what this tells us is cosine goes with the x value. Uh, sine goes with the y value. So we have cosine of pi over 2 is 0. Sine of pi over 2 is 1. The uh, x and y values or coordinates respectively there. All right, and if you plug that in, notice we do get an indeterminate form. Cosine of pi over 2 is 0. So we get for our numerator 0. And then in the denominator, since sine of pi over 2 is 1, we get 1 minus 1, which is also 0. So this tells us that we can apply L'Hopital's rule. Always check that before you go into uh, calculating the derivatives of numerator and denominator. All right, if we do that here, the denominator is considerably simpler. Differentiating sine of x minus 1 turns into just cosine of x. For the numerator, cosine squared of x that we use the chain rule. So think uh, the outer function here is x squared. The inner function is cosine of x. And if you apply here, let's say specifically the general power rule, 
or when you have a function raised to a power, bring the power down, keep the inside the same, and then multiply by the derivative of the inside. That's where the minus sine of x comes from. That's the derivative of the inside function here, cosine. All right, from here, once you get to that point, you can simplify the limit, the expression, by noticing we have a factor of cosine in the numerator and denominator. Those cancel out, leaving you with negative two times sine of x. And this limit is no longer indeterminate. If you plug in uh, x equals pi over two, sine of pi over two is one. So we find here, our limit approaches the value negative two. All right, these examples, parts A, B, and C, are uh, about as straightforward and simple as it gets for questions dealing with L'Hopital's rule. Let's get to some, uh, I guess, more complicated examples and some uh, kind of uh, new approaches we can take with them. All right, so before we get to two uh, brief examples to illustrate some more uh, I guess, subtle aspects and complicated uh, questions. I wanna review two important things here. The first is if the indeterminate form is not of type zero over zero or infinity over infinity, for instance, maybe the indeterminate form is zero to the zero uh, or infinity minus infinity, you're typically going, then going to have to rewrite your function as some sort of fraction, f of x divided by g of x. At that point, hopefully you then have an indeterminate form for that rewritten function of type zero over zero or infinity over infinity. All right, a second important remark I wanna make, uh, make you aware of is that there are examples where you might have to apply L'Hopital's rule multiple times. So maybe there's an example where you have to apply L'Hopital's rule two or three times in a row to finally get the limit value. Let's take a look at an example to illustrate each of these important remarks. So for the first remark, let's take a look at this one, the limit as we approach zero from the right of the function x times natural log of x. Now this one here, you can see there are no fractions in it. We just have x times natural log of x. But does this give us an indeterminate form? Well, you have to be kind of familiar with the graph of natural log of x and some of its properties. I've conveniently drawn it here for you in case you forgot. And if you think of the graph of natural log of x, as you approach zero from the right side, uh, notice that vertical asymptote on the y-axis. As you approach zero from the right, the graph goes down towards negative infinity. So we say this limit here as x approaches zero from the right of natural log of x, that is negative infinity. All right, the other factor, which is just x, that approaches zero, so we get an indeterminate form here of type zero times infinity. While that is an indeterminate form, it's not one of our basic fractional types, zero over zero or infinity divided by infinity. So we have to rewrite our function as some sort of fraction in order to uh, apply L'Hopital's rule. All right, and what we're gonna do is basically rewrite this using some, uh, some algebra. Recall that when you uh, divide by a fraction, it's the same thing as multiplying by the reciprocal. So we're basically here going to reverse that and rewrite that factor of x as a factor of one over x in this denominator. So we rewrote our function here as natural log of x divided by one over x. Just make sure you're comfortable simplifying that. Probably easier to go from the expression on the right here to what's on the left. When you divide by one over x, same thing as multiplying by its reciprocal x. And that gives you the expression x natural log of x on the left side there. All right, this expression or function now has an indeterminate form of type infinity divided by infinity. Natural log of x approaches negative infinity 
as uh, x approaches zero from the right, and one over x, uh, that also um, approaches infinity as zero approaches, uh, as, we, as x approaches zero from the right. So we get an indeterminate form here, infinity over infinity, we can now apply L'Hopital's rule. All right, the derivatives here are pretty straightforward. If you differentiate natural log of x, that's a basic derivative, one over x. And it might be easiest to differentiate uh, that denominator, one over x, if you rewrite that first as x to the minus one. And you can apply the power rule, and you should find that you can write your derivative of one over x as minus one over x squared. Uh, the power rule would give you x to the negative two. That's why we have an x squared in that denominator. All right, at this point, we can just simplify this expression algebraically. All that mess of a, a fraction within a fraction just reduces to minus x. The work down there is there in case you're um, uh, not comfortable with that quickly. So uh, uh, do take that division by uh, negative one over x squared. And instead of dividing by that fraction, multiply by the reciprocal negative x squared over one. And you should see there that the um, one power of x cancels out, leaving you with a uh, negative x as that end result. All right, and at this point, we're done. Negative x does not have a uh, indeterminate form. As x approaches zero, negative x just approaches zero. So we get as our limit here uh, for x natural log of x as we approach zero from the right, we get a limit of zero. All right, so be aware of that. If your original limit doesn't give you a fractional indeterminate form, you might have to rewrite your function first as a fraction like we did here. All right, the second remark above there about applying L'Hopital's rule multiple times, here's a simple example to illustrate that. At this point, maybe pause the video if you wanna give yourself an attempt at this. This one also requires you to rewrite it, but we'll check in in a few minutes first. All right, welcome back. Let's go through this one here. First, we want to check that we do have some sort of indeterminate form. Here, you're going to want to be familiar with basic graphs of exponential functions. The graph of uh, e to the negative x is there. And as you let x approach positive infinity, that function has a horizontal asymptote of y equals zero. So as you go very far to the right for your x values, the y values get close to that asymptote zero. So we do have here an indeterminate form of type infinity times zero. As x approaches infinity, x squared also approaches infinity. All right, now this one is, um, I think, pretty, uh, pretty easy compared to the one above and obvious of how to rewrite it just think the relationship between negative exponents and fractions. I can rewrite that e to the negative x as one over e to the x. And now we pretty effortlessly get a fraction x squared divided by e to the x, which now gives us an indeterminate form of type infinity over infinity. That means we're in business, we can apply L'Hopital's rule. If you got stuck a little bit earlier making an attempt at this, maybe pause the video and again and see if you can finish the, the, uh, the, the problem from here. All right, let's wrap this one up. Since we have an indeterminate form, we can apply L'Hopital's rule. I'm gonna differentiate the numerator and denominator individually. And x squared is gonna to turn to two x for its derivative and e to the x stays the same as e to the x. 
Well, notice that we again have an indeterminate form for this limit of type infinity divided by infinity. And what that tells us is we can apply L'Hopital's rule yet again. So if you apply L'Hopital's rule one more time there, differentiate 2x to get 2, e to the x still differentiates to itself e to the x. The final limit that we arrive at here is no longer indeterminate. This has the form 1 over a quantity that keeps getting bigger since e to the x is growing exponentially. And what we know earlier in the course we mentioned this relationship 1 over an increasingly bigger quantity should get smaller. So what we find here, taking that to the extreme, as that denominator becomes as big as possible, that fraction should get as small as possible, approaching zero. All right, now with these examples and remarks pointed out, let's take a look at one final example in example two. All right, this one is a standard example that a, um, uh, a typical calculus course will cover when dealing with L'Hopital's rule, which is the limit of the function x to the x, or x raised to the x power. And we're going to see what happens uh, with that as a limit as x approaches 0 from the right. Now, why is this a standard question in a calculus course? Well, notice if you plug in x as 0, we get the indeterminate form 0 to the 0. Now there's a question there in the box, what should 0 to the 0 equal? Should it be 0 or should it be 1? You might be thinking 0 to any power is 0, right? 0 squared is 0, 0 cubed is 0. So 0 to the 0 might seem reasonable to define it as 0. But you're also thinking a number to the 0 power is 1, like 2 to the 0, e to the 0. Those are all equal to 1. Now, this is part of what makes indeterminate forms a little bit um, tricky to deal with, why we need kind of the precise tools of calculus. And there is not a clear answer here for what we should say 0 to the 0 equals. It kind of depends on um, what part of mathematics you're working on. But I'll point out with this example to you at the end that I think there is a reasonable or sensible uh, uh, value to assign to 0 to the 0. All right. Now, how we actually see what that sensible uh, or logical answer should be. We're stuck here. Our indeterminate form, 0 to the 0, is not one of our fractional indeterminate forms, 0 over 0 or infinity over infinity. So we're left with this question. How can we rewrite x to the x power? And this is a little bit tricky. We're not going to try to necessarily rewrite this as a fraction but we're going to make use of another technique in solving mathematical problems. See if you can rewrite the problem as a familiar problem. And what I'll have you think back to in one of the last examples we looked at illustrating some important remarks, we had the limit as x approaches 0 to the right of the function x times natural log of x. Now I'm giving you a hint here. How might we rewrite this exponential expression, x to the x, involving natural logs? Well, we have some properties of exponentials and logs, the cancellation properties, since they are inverses of one another. When you plug e to the x into natural log of x and vice versa, both combinations should cancel out to x, like we have here. Now, we're not going to use both of these, but for our purposes, we're going to use that first cancellation property to rewrite the base of our function, which is x. We're going to rewrite x as e raised to the natural log of x. So if we start with our expression, x to the x power, 
I like to just put a set of parentheses around the base quantity. So we'll put a set of parentheses around the base x. And what we're doing here is rewriting using that property of exponentials and logs that x is also equal to e to the natural log of x. An alter alternate way to do this is what's called with the uh, change of base formula, but this is probably a simpler way, uh, especially since myself, I don't even recall or keep track of the change of base formula for exponentials. I always use this trick, e to the natural log of x equals x. That's a way that we can convert one base to base e and uh, back and forth. All right, now we still have in that expression the exponent x on the outside, but just recall some basic exponent rules. When you have an outer and inner power, you can just multiply them. So I can rewrite my function here, x to the x, as the exponential expression e, and then in the exponent, we've multiplied and got x times natural log of x. Notice just to the side there, to the right, we have that earlier example we did just a few moments ago, where we found x times natural log of x approaches zero as x approaches zero from the right. And what we have done, as mentioned earlier going through this problem, is we have taken an uh, existing mathematical problem, the limit of x to the x, and we have now basically expressed it as something that is familiar to us, the limit of x times natural log of x. Now, how do we pull this all together? We start with our original limit, x to the x power. Right above, we rewrote that, x to the x as e raised to the x natural log of x. And what we can do, is make use of a property of limits where we have a limit of some continuous function, e to the x or exponential functions are continuous. We can bring the limit inside that function. For exponential functions, the inside is up in the exponent. So the limit as x approaches zero from the right, we can bring that up into the exponent and what we have is that earlier limit that we evaluated, the limit as x approaches zero from the right of x times natural log of x. Earlier in this lecture, we found that limit comes out to be zero. And that basically finishes the problem for us. The limit up in that exponent approaches zero, but zero is not our limit. What we have there left over, the limit in the exponent is zero. So what we uh, get for our limit is e to the zero. Anything to the zero power is one. So what we find here is x to the x approaches one as x approaches zero from the right. And this gives us what I was, uh, alluding to earlier as the sensible way to define zero to the zero. Since using limits, we see that x to the x approaches one as x approaches zero from the right. And this is our um, probably simplest way to give a value to zero to the zero. The uh, standard accepted definition for that value, zero to the zero, usually in mathematics, it's defined to be one. Realizing though, zero to the zero is technically indeterminate. So there might be an alternate place in your mathematical journey where you define zero to the zero as some alternate value. Here, applying our result from example two, we find we should say zero to the zero equals one. 